Um, Just excited, as I said today, to be here. It is Easter. It is a good day. I'm going to read for you a little bit of passage, and then we will jump into uh, the the sermon today. The passage we are mostly going to be hanging out in today, if you have a Bible, you can grab one from under the pews, uh, U-version on your apps, whether it's iPhone or Android or whatever you got, U-version is a good Bible. Uh, Feel free to grab a Bible, and I'm going to be in John 20 almost exclusively today. John 20, starting in verse 24, all the way through the end of it. And I'm going to read that to you here to kick this off. It says, Now Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your fingers here. See my hands? Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen yet believe. Verse 30, Jesus says, or it says that Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. So reads God's word, amen. Now, every thinking person sometimes wrestles with doubt. And that's true not only for thinking Christians, but also for atheists and agnostics as well. I mean, sometimes they wonder, what if I really am wrong and there really is a God? And every thinking Christian sometimes wonders, well, what if I'm wrong and Christianity's not true? For some, the, the bouts of doubt are you know, rare and short and relatively minor. But for others, doubt can be deep and disturbing. But wherever you may be on that spectrum, if you've been a Christian for very long, you've probably gone through a battle or two with some level of questioning and doubt. Now, the sources of those struggles may vary. Uh, Sometimes it stems from wrestling with certain difficult theological issues. Other times it can be the problem of unanswered prayer. That's, you know, that's tripped me up at times. Um, And I've had to face doubts, you know, related to those age-old questions, those age-old problems, things like suffering, right? Why does an all-powerful God allow His people to die right in the prime of their lives, right? And and why, why, why do children suffer, right? While there are different biblical answers to all of those sources of our doubts, there is one answer that kind of undergirds all of them. And I usually come back to that one whenever it is that I I find myself struggling with doubt. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 13 through 19, that the entirety of the Christian faith rests on one foundation. And that foundation is the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. If that fact of history is true, then our faith as Christians has solid footing in spite of whatever doubts we might have, in spite of whatever things we can't necessarily cognitively resolve, perhaps ever in this life even. Now on the other hand, if Jesus Christ has not risen from the dead, then the strongest faith in the world is truly completely useless because it rests on a faulty foundation. Now if you want to study a subject... Generally, the best practice then is to go to some sort of an expert on that subject. And the very most famous expert on doubt is a fellow whose name is always linked to doubt, right? A man by the name, we always seem to call him Doubting Thomas, right? His history is told in John 20, 24 through 29, as I just read. Not all doubters are truly sincere. Some people who doubt use their so to speak, doubts, as a smokescreen to hide behind their sin. And the sin is actually the real issue. If one area of doubt gets cleared up for them, they just find another area of doubt so they can keep having reasons to not really believe. And they just duck from doubt to doubt to doubt rather than ever dealing with the underlying sin. 
These people don't need more evidence to believe. They need to repent of their sin to believe. But some doubts are truly sincere. The sincere doubter is, is often truly a, a believer in Christ. He or she doesn't necessarily want to doubt, but sometimes we do find ourselves as believers plagued by honest questions. This person will often find themselves in submission to God and wanting to please God, but he just can't close out those questions and isn't always ready to make that leap of faith. And so sometimes we need evidence to help us clear up our doubts. And Thomas was one of those types of sincere believers. He was a sincere believer, but a sincere doubter. And I believe that if you are a Christian for long enough, that you will go through times of sincere doubt. There are many causes of these doubts, but I'm going to limit myself today to exploring just some of the causes of Thomas's doubts. Now, I can personally relate to a number of them. I can't relate to all of them, but I can relate to a number of the same struggles that Thomas goes through, and perhaps you can relate to them as well. And the first reason for Thomas's doubt would simply be this. His personal failure, coupled with his personality, triggered his doubts. You see, all of the disciples, all of them, had failed Jesus on the night in which he was betrayed. The night in which he was arrested and sent to trial. Most notorious, of course, was Peter. Peter denied the Lord three different times before the cock crows, right? But all of the eleven had promised Jesus their loyalty. And each and every one of them that night deserted him when he was arrested. Thomas, along with Peter, had been very outspoken in his loyalty to Jesus before the crucifixion. In John eleven sixteen, when Jesus wanted to go to Bethany, he wanted to go to Bethany, which is this little town near Jerusalem. He wanted to go there because his good, good friend had died. His friend Lazarus was dead. He wanted to go there and, and raise Lazarus from the dead. But his disciples were counseling Jesus. Jesus, it's too dangerous for us to go. We shouldn't go there. We don't want to go there. No, let's not. Jesus, let's stay here. But Thomas, on the other hand, Thomas said, let us also go that we might die with him, with Jesus. Thomas might have been a bit of a pessimist, but at least he was loyal to the point of challenging all of the other disciples to be committed to the point of willing to go with Jesus to their deaths. But then, he joined all of the others in running away in the night in which Jesus was arrested. And I believe that night and that failure of his led Thomas into depression and doubt. It wasn't just Thomas's failure, but his failure coupled with his personality that led him into this place of deep doubt. You see, Peter had failed in a big way too, right? But the difference is, Peter was buoyant, he was optimistic, right? He was, he was a guy who might feel bad about his mistakes, but then he was over it, right? He was moving on to the next thing. He could shrug it off. It was water off a duck's back for Peter when he made a mistake. He was at least making a mistake going forward, and he was happy to try it again, right? That was the way Peter was. But Thomas, Thomas was this conscientious, this deeply loyal, but seems like kind of gloomy type of guy. And he did not commit himself to something lightly. And to commit himself to Jesus and then to go back on his word affected Thomas much, much more deeply than Peter's failure had affected him. Now we're all wired differently. And so it's important for us to know ourselves so that we can be on guard against our weaknesses. And usually, by the way, our areas of greatest strength, they are often our areas of greatest weakness as well. A man like Thomas, who is incredibly loyal and conscientious, who, who takes his commitments seriously, right, is also more prone to depression and doubt when he fails. And that's what he exactly felt like he had done. Now, the second reason for Thomas's doubts would be a lack of understanding led to his doubts. You see, Thomas lacked understanding with regards to the Lord's departure. On the night before the crucifixion, Jesus had told his disciples that he was going to go and prepare a place for them, that he would come again, and that he would take them to be with him. He told them that. 
And he told them that they knew the way that they were going. But Thomas, he, he didn't understand. So he blurts out in John 14, 5, we have it recorded there. He says, he says Lord, we don't know where you are going. How, how do we know the way? Well, I at least am glad that he asked Jesus this. Because Jesus' reply in John 14, 6 was, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. But if you put yourself back into that situation with all of the confused emotions of that night, with the disciples still limited sight and limited insight into Jesus' death and resurrection, you can kind of begin to see how Thomas would be confused. He didn't understand what Jesus meant. He lacked understanding, which led to his doubt. Some of my own personal battles uh, of doubt have fallen into this category. Um, it's, it's when you go through like some deeper doctrinal matters. Now, I'm not going to tell you what ones because I don't want to lead you to doubts of your own. But I, I've, I've certainly struggled through that. I, I went to seminary, and one of the one of the most painful, refining parts of seminary was having to go through and look at each and everything that I thought I believed, that I thought was biblical, and then having to occasionally come to a conclusion. I'm wrong. Ow. That's uncomfortable. Especially to having to admit that among your peers. And go, oh, I thought this was the way it was, but now I see differently. But it's a great growing experience. And, and it's challenging. And, and it is okay to have those doubts. But frankly, there, there are many hard things taught in Scripture that could lead us to having questions. Some of those very hard questions will never be resolved on this side of the cross. We will not have the answers until we are with God in heaven. But we have to trust God even when we don't understand. That is an element of faith. In John 6.60, many of those who followed Jesus have turned away when He taught some hard things. Jesus even asked if the twelve disciples, if they too would turn away. And Peter, of course, in a very Peter way, gives this great Peter answer in John 6, 68 and 69. Jesus has just said, are you guys going to turn away from me? And Peter goes, Lord, to whom else shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. And I've come back to those very words of Peter so many times when I've struggled with doubt due to a lack of understanding. Jesus is the truth. Where else could I go? A third reason for Thomas's doubt was that deep disappointment and shock over suffering contributed to his doubts. You see, Thomas's doubt was significantly impacted by the disappointment and the shock that he felt as he watched Jesus die. Even though Jesus had repeatedly told His disciples in advance that He was going to be crucified, it never sank in. It over their heads. They missed that. And the disciples had expected this Messiah to come, right? To come as a conquering King. That's why they were shouting Hosanna. That's why they were laying the branches on Palm Sunday. They thought the King was riding in to conquer, to take Jerusalem, to give the Romans a boot and give us our land back. We will rule again and be the best in all of the land. That's what they were hoping for. But that's not what happened. A crucified Messiah was not in their expectations. And when Thomas saw the badly mangled body of Jesus hanging on the cross, it sent him into a, a tailspin. His emphasis on the wounds of Jesus in John 20:25 20, shows how deeply it affected him. The bloody holes in Jesus' hands and feet, the, the gory wound, the spear that was pushed into his side, the, the scourging of his back, the, the crown of thorns pressed down upon his head, haunted Thomas after the crucifixion and fed into his doubts. In the same way, whenever we face deep disappointment and, and shock because of some tragedy or, or something that doesn't go the way that we had expected it to go, we too are vulnerable to doubt. Years ago, uh, uh, a pastor friend of mine 
was struck down just like that with a brain aneurysm. And as I spoke to his wife uh, a couple of days before he died, I couldn't help wondering, why, Lord? This is one of your servants. He's still got many good years in him, right? He's got a lot of work to do still. Why should he die so young when so many wicked are prospering? Why should he go and these others live? Perhaps you've lost a loved one or or faced some sort of personal tragedy yourself. And it's a, a short step from there to being right where Thomas was, to doubting the Lord. If God really exists and God is a God of love, then why is this happening? That's where Thomas was. Another reason for Thomas's doubts was his isolation from fellow believers fueled his doubts. Now, we don't know for certain exactly why Thomas was absent from the other disciples that very first Sunday after Jesus appeared to them. But a likely reason was probably his morose disposition. You see, probably the last thing that Thomas wanted at a time like this when he had just seen Jesus crucified and died, the last thing he wanted to do was spend some time with people. And so he wandered off by himself. He went somewhere to brood over the the horrible events of the last couple days of his life. And then, to add insult to injury, to add to his misery, when he finally happens to run into all of these other guys, right? They tell him, Hey Thomas, guess what? We have seen the risen Lord. How would you feel if you missed a week of church, right? And then you came, and everybody here said, Yeah, you missed it last week. Jesus showed up. Right? You'd be like, Never missing church again. (laughs) Or depending on your end times, Why am I still here? Um, Different sermon, different day. Some of you get it, right? But, but that's what happens. Like, he shows up, he bumps into some of the guys. And they're like, Thomas, where were you? Jesus, Jesus showed up, man. And it was awesome. And I can just imagine his reaction. Oh, great. Kicking rocks. <laughs> I missed it. Right? That's how I'd be. Oh, every time. How did I miss this? But whenever we separate ourselves from the fellowship with other believers, it makes us vulnerable to doubt. And that's where Thomas was. Now, I've not covered all the causes for doubt. I couldn't even do that if we were here all morning. Perhaps you've had other things that have shaken your faith. But whatever the source of your doubts, the solution is always the same. It comes back to the foundational fact of the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. If that is true, then even though you might not understand everything, you still then, with Thomas, must acknowledge that Jesus is our Lord and God. You see, the the evidence for the bodily resurrection of Jesus is solid. I can't give you all the evidence this morning. But if you'd like some resources, check out, there's books like more of uh, uh, The Case for Christ or The Evidence That Dem- Demands a Verdict or there's a second book, More Evidence That Demands a Verdict. Um, but there are a bunch of things out there and I'd be happy to resource you if you're one of those people who's questioning or struggling. Let me know. We'll, we'll meet and talk and chat and maybe I can give you something to help you in that journey. But in this passage, there are five different things in John 20 that verify Christ's resurrection to be true history. And the very first one is simply this. The empty tomb verifies Jesus' resurrection. One incontrovertible fact was that the disciples and the Jews agreed, and they didn't agree on anything for the most part, but they agreed that the tomb was empty. If they hadn't, when the disciples were out proclaiming the resurrection, right? After this had occurred. When they're out walking about town telling people, hey, Jesus is gone. He's not in the tomb anymore, right? The Jews would not have put up with it. They would have simply produced, they would have gone down, rolled the rock away, pulled out Jesus and said, ah, here he is, dead. But clearly they couldn't do it. 
because he wasn't in the tomb. The tomb was empty. Now, there's several different ways to account for the tomb being empty. I mean, of course, Jesus' enemies could have stolen the body, right? But what is your motivation for that? It was to their advantage, in fact, to leave the body there as evidence that he was dead. Why would you steal the very evidence that would prove that you were right? This is exactly why they had Pilate put Roman guards in front of the tomb and then had them seal the tomb. Because they knew if the body disappeared, there might be some questions. But if they knew where the body was at, they could produce it, they could silence anybody who began to preach about his resurrection. Now, another possibility, of course, is that the Roman guards themselves might have stolen the body. But again, it doesn't make sense. There's no motive for them to do so. They weren't concerned about this Jewish religious trial and this infighting among these two, what they probably would have seen as religious cults. They didn't care about that. The Jewish leaders, who were scrambling for ways to explain away the resurrection, never once accused the soldiers of taking the body or allowing it to be stolen. Now, a third possibility is that the disciples stole the body. That's possible. This was a theory that the Jewish leaders tried to promote by, by bribing Roman soldiers. We see that in Matthew 28. But there are many reasons the disciples could not have moved Jesus' body. First, the tomb was made secure by some Roman soldiers. These guys were guys who were all about business. They knew what guarding something was about. And we know these soldiers wouldn't have fallen asleep on the watch because if you fell asleep on your watch as a Roman soldier, you could be punished by death. And this, this stone, this is a big stone, not a little stone. We're not talking about a little pebble, but this is a boulder. This is a big, heavy thing. And it wasn't like, like they were standing there and they didn't hear, as this big thing gets moved away from the tomb. They would have heard it, at the very least, even if they weren't paying attention. But none of that happened. Imagine the disciples trying to rob the grave in front of Roman guards. How would that have turned out for them? Not particularly well. And even if they had tried to remove Jesus' body, even if they'd managed it, why then would they have risked their lives later attesting to the fact that He had rose from the dead? Why would they put their very lives on the line preaching a message that if they had stolen the body wasn't true? Why would they have suffered beatings, un undue threats, if it hadn't been confirmed that He had risen from the grave? Jesus' body, which was first thought of by the women who entered the tomb first that morning, we see earlier in John 20, they, they go in and they look, right? And they... They see nothing. Nothing is in there but the clothes. They run back and tell the men. And the men, of course, come. And they look. Interesting little segment of passage there. Because as they look in there, they see just a grave clothes, but not a body. At first, Mary Magdalene, when she looks, she doesn't look too, too super closely. She sees that the stone has been removed. And so she simply assumes that, that Jesus was gone. And that's when she runs and tells Peter and John, and who then run, and, and if Scripture could be trusted, John's pretty fast. And John gets there first, and he stands there at the entrance looking in. Peter, in his, again, very Peter way, he just blusters his way in, right? He goes right into the tomb. And in, in John 20, verse 6, it says that Peter looked or saw the grave clothes. And the word for seeing there is to gaze upon them. He saw they were laying there, right? But it says then John came in and he saw the grave clothes. But the word for seeing there means to understand. See, Peter saw it with his eyes. John saw with his heart. John understood what the empty clothes meant. The presence of the grave clothes proves that the body wasn't stolen. I mean, the last time I was stealing a body, I didn't stop. Could I say that out loud? I mean, never mind. If, if you're stealing a body, do you stop and disrobe it? Fold the clothes up, leave them nice and orderly? 
right? You come in, I'm going to tidy up the tomb a little bit before we take the body today, right? Maybe hang something on a wall over here. No. You're in, you're out, you're done. If you're going to get rid of the clothes, you're doing it somewhere else. You're not doing it here. You might get caught, right? It doesn't make sense that you would leave that behind. Peter and John, they look and they see it's laying there in orderly fashion as if Jesus had just passed right from the tomb. Remember, these, these weren't men who so much wished, wished for a resurrection. They, they didn't quite know and understand what was going on. They weren't sure what to believe at first. But the evidence convinced them. And then their testimony of the evidence should convince us. Now, a third reason that we see in John 20 that attests to Jesus' bodily resurrection is this. The post-resurrection appearances of Jesus verify His resurrection. John lists four different resurrection or post-resurrection appearances of Jesus. Once to Mary Magdalene, to the disciples, all of them except for Thomas, of course, and then to the disciples, including Thomas, and then to seven of the disciples by the Sea of Galilee. And then Paul mentions that there were other appearances beyond that, including one particular time where Jesus appeared to over 500 people at once. You can find that in 1 Corinthians 15, 6 through 8. J.N.D. Anderson, who was the professor of Oriental Law and the director of the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies at the University of London, wrote this. The most, dramatic, or the most drastic way of dismissing the evidence would be to say that these stories were mere fabrications, that they were pure lies. But so far as I know, not a single critic today would take such an attitude. In fact, it would really be an impossible position. Think of the number of witnesses, over 500. Think of the character witnesses, men and women who gave the world the highest ethical teaching it has ever known, and who even on the testimony of their enemies, lived it out in their lives. Think of the psychological absurdity of picturing a little band of defeated cowards cowering in an upper room one day, and then a few days later transformed into a company that no persecution could silence, and then attempting to attribute this dramatic change to nothing, nothing more convincing than a miserable fabrication that they were trying to foist upon the world. He concludes with, that simply wouldn't make sense. The varied circumstances of the appearances and the, the different personalities of the witnesses mitigate against things like hallucinations or vision. And whether Thomas actually ever put his hand in Jesus' wounds, it doesn't actually tell us in Scripture. But Jesus made the offer to Thomas, and Thomas was convinced. The post-resurrection appearances of Jesus are a strong evidence of His bodily resurrection. Another reason that attests to Jesus' bodily resurrection is the changed lives of the witnesses verify Jesus' resurrection. As I already said, John calls attention to the fact that none of the witnesses was expecting a resurrection. Mary Magdalene thought somebody had taken Jesus' body. The disciples were fearful and confused. Thomas was depressed and doubting. But all of them were transformed into a bold witness. These bold witnesses we read about in the book of Acts because they became convinced that Jesus had risen bodily from the dead. And they were so convinced that the resurrection was true that most of them went on to die horrific deaths because of it. Beheadings. A couple of them crucified. Peter says, I can't be crucified the normal way like Christ. That, that, I can't dishonor God like that. He crucified me upside down. They tried to boil John alive with oil. A bunch of horrible, terrible torture leading to the deaths of the closest followers of Jesus. Yet not one of them ever recanted. The final reason I'll give that attests to Jesus' resurrection is this. The unique person of Jesus Christ verifies His resurrection. If you would just study the Gospel accounts of who Jesus was, of what He taught, of the miracles that He performed, of the prophecies, many, many prophecies that He fulfilled, on more than one occasion, He predicted His own death. 
and his own resurrection. You can find that in John 2, and you can find that in Luke 9, for instance. His encounter with the doubting Thomas shows that his purpose was to bring people just like Thomas into a place full of faith that he was indeed God. And when Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God, Jesus did not rebuke him. Jesus did not correct him. Jesus did not say, No, you overstated it. Rather, Jesus commended Thomas for his correct perception and faith. A merely good teacher, especially a devout Jewish rabbi, would never accept such worship from one of his followers. A Jewish rabbi would never let somebody who studied under him worship him. No, that is reserved for God. And everything in the Gospel accounts about Jesus' person and teachings speaks against his being a charlatan or a lunatic. And so the only sensible option is that He is who He claimed to be. That He is the Lord God in human flesh. The Christ of Israel. The eternal Son of God. He offered Himself for our sins. And God raised Him bodily from the dead. And He wants those of us who have not seen Him to believe in Him nonetheless. I'll close with this story. In Loving God, Chuck Colson. Some of you know who Chuck Colson was, right? has an interesting chapter titled Watergate Watergate and the Resurrection. There Colson makes the point that with the most powerful office in the world at stake, the President of the United States, with all the privileges of power, with threats of imprisonment, ten men in the White House could not hold together a conspiracy for longer than two weeks. For the biggest, most powerful position in the world. And then he then applies his experience, because he was an insider during the Watergate cover-up. He applies his experience in that to modern criticism of the gospel accounts of the resurrection. That the disciples were mistaken, or that it was only a myth that Jesus' followers had conceived some plot to cover up his death. And Colson concludes on page 69 of that book. He says, is it really likely then that a deliberate cover-up, a plot to perpetuate a lie about the resurrection, could have survived the violent persecution of the apostles, the scrutiny of the early church council, the horrendous purge of first century believers who were cast by the thousands to the lions for refusing to renounce the lordship of Christ? Is it not probable that at least one of the apostles, he says, would have renounced Christ before being beheaded or stoned? Is it not likely that some smoking gun document might have been produced exposing the Passover plot? Surely, one of the contributors and one of the conspirators would have made a deal with the authorities. But they didn't. Take it from one who was inside the Watergate web looking out, who saw firsthand how vulnerable a cover-up is. Nothing less than witnessing the resurrection of Christ could have caused those men to maintain to their dying breath that Jesus is alive and is Lord. Does the evidence about Jesus' resurrection clear up all of our doubts about God in the Bible? No, it doesn't. Nothing on this side of heaven will be able to do that. But it does provide a solid basis for intelligent faith in those times when we might be struggling with doubt. To whom else will you go? Jesus alone is the risen Savior. His desire for each of us who have not seen Him is that, like Thomas, we would not be unbelieving, but believing. He wants each of us to recognize that He, our Lord and God, died in our place, taking the penalty that we deserved for our sin. And he wants us to join Thomas in believing and in worship, proclaiming, My Lord and my God. If you wait to trust Christ until all of your doubts are cleared up, you're not an honest doubter. Rather, you're using your doubts as an excuse so you can hold on to your sins. If you don't repent, you'll go to your death alienated from your Savior. There is more than adequate evidence that supports a reasonable faith that Jesus Christ is who He said He is, our risen Savior. 
The question is, will you lay aside your doubts, which serve only as excuses, and trust in Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Will you? Let's pray. Father God, we are humbled and amazed that you would show your love for us in this radical and incredible and unimaginable way. God, it is humbling that you would enter into our world, that you loved us so much that you sent your Son to die for us. And that as Jesus came into the world, Lord, you tell us He did not come to condemn us, but rather to free us. Lord, this morning I pray that each and every person here today could know that freedom. Father God, you are so good. You tell us in Scripture that you loved us before we even knew you existed. So that since before there was time, that you had a plan for our salvation. God, we are thankful for that. God, if there's somebody who has just been walking in doubt, questioning, wondering, uncertain of, is Jesus really who He said He was? I pray today, God, that You would remove that doubt. Lord, each and every one of us are sinners in need of a Savior. The, so to speak, goody-goody Christian and the guy who's not following your ways at all. We are all broken. We are all sinners. If you find yourself here gathered with us today and doubts have raged and you've struggled, my prayer for you is that today would be the day that you step over, step forward in faith. Put your trust in Jesus. If God's been working on your heart and you are wanting to have that relationship with Him, I would just invite you to pray along with me. Simply pray these words. Dear God, I know that I am a sinner and there is nothing I can do to save myself. Right now, today, God, I confess that I am completely helpless to forgive my own sins, that I cannot work my way to heaven, Lord. And at this moment, I trust in Christ and Christ alone as the one who bore my sin when He died on the cross. God, I believe that He did all of that. And He did everything that will ever be necessary for me to stand in Your holy presence when You call me home to heaven. Father God, I thank You that Christ was raised from the dead as a guarantee of my own resurrection. And as best as I can now, Lord, I right now transfer my trust to Him. I am grateful that He has promised to receive me despite my many sins and my many failures. Lord God, I take You at Your Word. I thank You that I can now face death knowing that You are my Savior. Thank You, God, for the assurance that You will walk with me in the deep valleys in the darkest of days. Thank You, God, for hearing this prayer. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.